You're listening to the Wired for Impact podcast. All right, I am here with Versan Aljra again, once again. Thank you for coming on, Versan. It's a pleasure. What you guys do is very commendable. Thank you, man. Really appreciate that. Right back at you. What you and your brother are doing to illuminate what's actually happening in the financial world is nothing short of remarkable. Your channel's growing. You're having some very, very credible people on to talk about blockchain technologies and the various things there. So congratulations again on the success that you guys are having. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I had Versan and his brother on not too long ago. He is one of the two brothers of the Black Swan Capitalists. And as I just mentioned, you guys are doing a lot of educating for folks that are unaware of what technologies are available in the crypto space, as well as better understanding even just fundamental ideas about money and inflation and how all of what's happening in the world right now is going to affect all of us. So, you and I have talked and gotten to know each other a little bit more offline, and I want, we're going to have some conversations today that are not really focused on the financial side of things. But being that you are in that space, I know a lot of my listeners are going to want to hear just an update from you. So let's give folks a quick overview of where things are at with XRP. The last conversation you and I had on this podcast, XRP was still XRP slash Ripple, the company that essentially oversees the distribution of XRP was tied up in a lawsuit with the SEC. So let's give a quick update now that that lawsuit is over and Ripple has won that case. Where do you see with XRP and the future of XRP? Sure. So that's the first thing everyone's asking about is what's going on with Ripple? XRP now. But this legal battle, for those that don't know, has been going on for almost two and a half years now. But we've reached a pivotal moment where in this crypto space now that Ripple has actually gained some clarity. And the SEC's chances now they're talking about doing an appeal. And that's also why we saw the price of XRP go up because of the positive news. But the SEC is now putting the news out there that they want to appeal. But I want to make it very clear that if they are going to try to appeal, that is going to backfire. It might also take much longer, almost a year maybe, if they want to appeal. And Ripple could play the same game now that they were playing with Ripple initially and just continue to drag it on. And by the time from a year from now, if they keep dragging this on, all this adoption is going on, all this money is going on. So there's there's nothing there. There's nothing tangible. It's not realistic. So I think that's the most important thing. And you're seeing all this news again. But the truth is... Let's just kind of go away from that, walk away from it, because there is the verdict is final. That's not going to change it. And now there's this newfound clarity, which has significant implications for the entire crypto industry moving forward, because what this did was really set a precedent for defining the regulatory landscape, which means now the fog is beginning to lift. So you're going to start to see more investors with confidence in the sector, leading to increased adoption and investments in digital assets overall moving forward. So uh, it's just a string of positive news, um, but this is what they do. They they like to put the tabloids out there and get people arguing and discussing of something that really has no weight. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating when you start to watch a little bit closer, you see what they say and how it differs from what they do. And when we're talking about they, we're talking, well, can you define who they are in your mind? The institutions. The which institutions. One, you know, yeah. it's hard to separate which ones now because we've seen institutions adopt the technology yet attack the company, Ripple. So same thing with, um, what was it, Bank of America. They were partnering with Ripple a long time ago. Then we saw some news about, oh, we're not sure what's going on here. But my point, though, is that there's so much adoption with the institutions, yet at the same time, the same institutions are attacking the narrative of Ripple. So... You know, something funny is going on. Yeah, there's definitely something funny going on. I, I think we could make some allegations by connecting a few dots. We don't necessarily have to get into that right now. But I do think it's a good precursor to the conversation that I want to have with you the, with the rest of this podcast, which is kind of why we're here in the first place. And you and I have started to learn and and p- pull the uh, the wool back from our eyes a little bit about how we got to this place in the first place. Uh, And I'm trying to think of how best to set it up. But to me, it's almost like what we're experiencing, I think, experiencing right now in the world is essentially a a corporate takeover. And it's like, how do you how do you combat against that? And it seems so convoluted and so entangled that it almost seems overwhelming and impossible to actually address. Now, you and I might have a little bit different interpretations. I'm explaining it, at least from my perspective, how I'm seeing it. And as I've started to learn some new things, and some of that came from a previous podcast with Brandon Williams, 
also with James Lovett, who were essentially saying, look, the U.S. is a corporation. And I don't know about you. When I first heard that, I was like, I mean, maybe. OK, like, I don't it's just paperwork. Right. Or it's just I don't know how that affects me. I don't know what kind of impact that has. And frankly, when I first started to hear about this stuff, it was like, I, I don't don't waste my time. It sounded like it's whatever. I don't want to hear about it. As right. I've started to learn more and more about it, though, man, there is a lot there. So why don't you share a little bit about your journey and when you first heard about that and where you're at with it now? Sure. So uh, this is the book you and I have been talking about. I actually would like to show it. It's called Meet Your Straw Man. It's a very interesting name. Uh, but this book is really about something called common law. So I'm going to break it down. Once you start reading this book, this is really what you discover. And this is this is real. This is a real laws that used to be implemented way before 1913. So first of all, stating to what you said, the United States Corporation, apparently there is a private company called the United States Corporation, and it's the non-federal reserve bank also, which was a private company that was set up in the year 1913. And every court and every police force and even Congress was a company of that same corporation. So it, it's very interesting. This is for the first time in a long time, I think people are beginning to understand that our history, our identity, and the very essence of our existence has really been constructed upon a layer of lies. And as we dig deeper, and you could do that in this book, you come face to face with shocking revelations that America, the land of the free, which is really no more than a colossal corporation, and you know our fundamental rights and our innate connection with the divine are stripped away from us the minute we're born without our knowledge or consent, and they render us more as mere assets on a global exchange. <laughs> L literal property, L like literally that they own you. It took me a while to wrap my head around all of this, and I had a big epiphany the other day, which sort of in my mind, sorted it all out. I'm a very visual learner and I like to think of things visually. I came across a video where a guy was explaining about jurisdictions and mm -hmm. uh, he essentially had, if you can think in your mind, like a target. And at the very center of the target was you, or at least what you think of as you. And then the next layer out was a jurisdiction. He gave the example of being in a Walmart, if you were an employee in the auto department of Walmart, there'd be certain expectations of you, certain rules that you'd have to follow. Well, if that auto department manager said, I want you to work at two in the morning on Sunday, you would appeal to the higher jurisdiction. Well, who's the higher jurisdiction in that case? It'd be Walmart corporate. Say, hey, my mm -hmm. freaking manager's telling me to come in and work at two in the morning. You can't do that. And then if you zoom out to the next jurisdiction, it would be the corporation of the city. And we don't know this, but a lot of our cities are incorporated. So it'd be the corporation of, say, Detroit. And then if you zoom out, that there's the corporation of Michigan. If you zoom out from there, that's where we get to what we're talking about right now. It's the corporation of the United States. Now, we all might think like, at least when I first started hearing about this, I was thinking like, well, OK, I mean, is that sort of how you document this kind of things? I, I didn't fully understand what um, what people like Brandon Williams and James Lovett have been teaching us in the books that we're reading is that there is a corporation called the United States, but it really is only talking about the 10 square miles around the D.C. area and that there is legalese around that concept, but that the United States itself, what we don't realize is that there's a higher jurisdiction called common law, which is how the country was founded, the Constitution resides at that level of jurisdiction, but we're all playing on these lower jurisdictions in what's called admiral law or maritime law or contractual law. Commerce is another one. So those are all synonymous terms for those lower jurisdictions. And we're fighting in those lower jurisdictions, not realizing all we have to do is step out and claim our rights that we have in common law jurisdiction. It's fascinating. On, we're spot on. It, but however, you know, it is indeed a very tragic reality that human life, the pinnacle of creation, has been reduced to mere merchandise by those who hold power. And I think the world is now seeing, has been seeing the, their lives through a distorted lens that places profit over human well being. But this is really where it begins. Again, the way they operate is on a corporate governance structure. So with policies aimed at maximizing profit again, rather than protecting the true welfare. Uh, this is just political theater, everything that we see around. 
But this is really where it starts. So when everybody is born in a hospital, you know how your mother signs the papers, you know, and but what, what's happening when you're signing those papers, we are unwillingly enrolled into a system when you're given birth into a hospital that transforms you into an asset of that corporation. Because when you sign the birth certificates and other legal documents, what you're actually signing on there is relinquishing your inherent rights and your subject yourself to this obligation that binds you into a corporate system. So you do become human capital the minute your mother signs that document. And it's crazy how rooted this is into everyday life and creation. <laughs> What's so interesting about that, as I've been learning, is you start to hear a lot of terminology that are consistent with water and things on the water. So for example, you come down your mother's birth canal, you're in water, you break out of water, and then you sign a birth certificate. Well, when ships are at sea and they're like at the Panama Canal, that is a birth canal. And the birth is a portion of the ship. And when you pull up to the dock, which is also doctor, but when you pull up to the dock, you sign a birth certificate to certify the position of the, the boat, as I understand it. There's so many terms about water, which is somebody shared that with me. And I was like, Again, like that just sounds weird. I don't know if I fully like, is that just coincidence? Is that just what have you? But I I dug a little bit and I don't know if you've heard this yet or not, but I found that when the country went through the Revolutionary War, obviously we fought the British. It's my understanding that the king at the time said, OK, you know what? You pesky Americans, fine, you can have the land, but we're going to maintain control over the seas. Obviously, they had the, the largest and strongest Navy at the time. And the Americans were like, yeah, that's fine. We're still going to need to work with you because we need goods from overseas, et cetera. And so what they developed was a essentially admiral law or maritime law, which basically said, look, you have your own law of the land. Maybe you've heard that term before. You've got the law of the land, but there's going to be the law of the water. And so the king at the time created you know, contractual law, commerce law, which is why we basically have different rules and agreements when we're taking in goods from overseas. And America at the time, as I understand it, operated again still under that jurisdiction of common law, which by the way, common law is best known as essentially no harm, no foul, no victim, no crime. So for example, if you're today, if you're driving and you break the speed limit, but there's no victim, under common law, there's no crime. There's no penalty because there's no victim. Under contractual law or admiral law or maritime law, there's an agreement, there's an engagement. And so if you break the speed limit, oh, now you're gonna get, you know, a little spanking from mom and dad because you broke you broke the rules and you're gonna get a little ticket. So anyway, so I'd heard about those two that, that, that the king came up with the contractual or maritime law. And I, there was apparently a, a treaty of it was called the Treaty of Verona, which was a, a meeting between I think the Pope at the time and the King of England. And they said, you know, those Americans, like we can't have jurisdiction over them. We're trying to to create subjects again because that's how the rest of the world history has operated is under king and subjects. And apparently what they devised to do at that point in time was to infiltrate the land with water law. And so that's why we start to hear all these water terms when it comes to the birth, when it comes to our court system, we typically think of our court system, at least I grew up thinking our court system was a a place of justice, a place of where you could, you know, appeal to your peers and and have right and wrong sorted out. The courts are owned by these corporations. They are extensions of commerce, which is mind blowing. I don't yeah, know if you were aware I, of that or not. I actually was not, but you know, everything under common law, when we start to look at it, everything gets thrown out the window. <laughs> <laughs> and that really what what that does there is you're you're breaking the chain uh, as far as being bounded by these laws that are here to subjugate us but if we can break those chains and free ourselves then you know things could really change in the world i, I think that in the us we use a lot of euphemisms and that's kind of what you were talking about a little bit in the beginning euphemisms they use different they change words to confuse you and to get you looking somewhere else. So 
I, I just find that interesting too. But I'm I'm still learning so much from this book. I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> but you know. yeah, there's there's so many there's so much information that's out there on this, and th- the way that I now understanding it is that it's not that they took them away. It's not that they took away the rights. It's that you became contractually obligated and therefore subject to that level of jurisdiction. Apparently, there was a case, a Supreme Court case in the 1800s where a gentleman was walking by a train car. And I guess the train started up and started to move. And there was a board sticking out of the train and it hit the man's leg and he was injured. And so he went to sue Erie Railroad Company. And under common law, there's a victim, therefore there's a crime. And so he sued the company. And this was a huge pivot point in American history, as I understand it, because the Supreme Court at that time said, you know what? You had no contractual agreement with the company. Therefore, there's no liability. Therefore, there's no penalty. And so from that point forward, we started to operate more under admiral law or water law or contractual law, and we essentially abandoned common law. It's still there. Th- this is what, to me, I think is a huge, huge, like possibly history-altering awakening to understand that we've been contracted into these lower jurisdictions and that the common law jurisdiction is still there and it is still available, but we just need to exercise it. We're not exercising those rights. We're not standing up and exercising those rights and basically untangling ourselves from the contractual obligations that we have. Another problem with this also is the fact that there are too many people that do not know about this common law. So for instance, if we were to take common law and actually practice it right now, you and I would not be paying taxes at all because we don't have to legally. You know, it's optional and this is clear. And even this is clear even in today's law. It's not it's not just common law. But if I, you and I started practicing this common law and we stopped paying our taxes, we'd be arrested or they would come and confiscate our goods, right? But see, if everyone did it together, there's nothing they could do. The problem is that when they started putting these new laws into place, most people kind of went and abided by them because they were fearful. And this is what governments do. Well, this is what the corporation did. They put these laws into place where you're afraid to practice what has been given to you. Because if you did that, you'd be arrested or subjugated. And they can't allow that because it's a threat to their power. Well, but let's say that you did get arrested. People have been starting to do this and they have started to have issues with the government, i.e. the corporation. And and in that case, you're really at a you're at a pivot point because you need to be able to communicate and operate as if you are absolutely in that common law jurisdiction. The research that I've done has shown that there are people that will, you know, they'll make that claim, hey, I don't have to pay taxes, for example. And they may get arrested or they may get some of their assets taken from them, et cetera. And at that point in time, they're in an entanglement with the courts. Uh, and if you understand that the courts are a corporation, they're now in a uh, entanglement of words and being able to define themselves. And I'm finding that there are some people that are unable to effectively stand in the common law jurisdiction, and they basically continue to entangle themselves and bind themselves into contractual arrangement. And a lot of this comes down to words and what words you use. One word, for example, is if the judge says to you, do you understand what I'm saying? In certain areas of understanding, understanding means I'm under you. And so when you're when you confess, yes, I understand I'm under your authority, your subjugation, then whoops, now you're back into that lower jurisdiction. But on the other hand, there are people that are that are knowing their common law rights, that are standing up for those common law rights, that are communicating in a way that doesn't entangle them in the lower jurisdictions and they are getting out of things like paying taxes, which sounds crazy, but it's actually happening. Yeah. There in this book, it there are real cases where people have applied common law. And that's basically what you're saying. They've applied common law and they've managed to break the contractual agreement. But yeah, you have to know how to practice this. I, I think it's pretty amazing. But you know, it, it'd be amazing if we could actually take this into court and read it in front of the judge there just to get an idea. 
But I think the most important thing I was looking at in here was the debt. There, there are some key aspects of debt in common law practice, the contractual obligations in common law. Most debt will arise from a contractual agreement between two parties, for instance, you and the institution or the bank where you get a loan or something. And if you can't actually pay that back off, they'll usually come after you. But if you actually practice the common law here, that shouldn't have been set up in the first place, which means that whole thing is just thrown out the window too. But applying it is a very different scenario, trying to apply yeah. it to see what the results are. So if a bank contacted me and said, Versan, you have this money paid off, you know, I, would I actually try to apply this? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a, bit, a little bit um, shocked, you know. What's interesting also is my friend gave this to me. He's an intelligence officer. He worked for the Ministry of the United Kingdom Intelligence Defense. And he was the one who told me to read into this. But, you know, I have to get through the book first. I didn't get as much through it as you probably have, but. I, I, well, and I've been, I've been researching this off and on for the last probably year and a half. The thing that started to finally shift my mind a little bit is seeing real cases of people having different outcomes where I would have assumed, oh, if you didn't pay your taxes, you're going to jail kind of a thing. I started to see more and more cases of people who were able to hold their jurisdiction at the common law. And yes, back to your point, we don't realize, but taxes are voluntary. And that's literally coming from the IRS commissioner himself. Go on YouTube and search the IRS commissioner of voluntary taxes, and you'll see him It's in congressional testimony say multiple times, Hey, we don't want to rock the boat too much because our system is voluntary. We don't want our people to, to, you know, to stop paying into this, but it is voluntary. He says it multiple times. But do you know who I think her name is Sheila Jackson? Do you ever come across her video? Sounds familiar, but the video you're referring to, I actually saw it the other day. And yep. that's my point is that there's a lot of validation. If you go look for it, if you go look for it, it's right there. Sheila Jackson was an IRS agent. And uh, if you haven't seen her stuff yet, go look it up, go to YouTube and, and search her. It's it's wild because she basically tells the story of how she was an IRS agent. And she went around and she was like, you know, I was, you know, super smart and I got great grades and I went and I now had this IRS agency and I had my little badge and I'd go into these companies and I'd flash my badge. And she's like, most people would immediately, you know, uh, OK, well, it will do whatever you say, or whatever. And then she came across an ad in the paper that said for anybody that can show me where the law says that we're obligated to pay taxes, they'll pay you fifty thousand dollars. And she was like, this is going to be the easiest 50 grand. You know, so she like started to went and look and she realized, oh, wait, hold on. All the information that she had been given to train with were basically summaries because the tax law is so convoluted and so entangled and so large. So they basically broke it down in all these guides. And so she's like, all right, well, those are my guides. Let me go actually look at the code itself. And she discovered that she could not find where it said that people are obligated to pay taxes. And she was like, holy crap, this is crazy. Um, yeah. And so again, there's just those those kinds of stories out there where people are showing that this is, it, it is a, a bit of a ruse. Yeah, well, you know, Taxes are often viewed as an inevitable obligation imposed by government. Remember, imposed by government to main, maintain the public services and welfare. But there's a controversial perspective that exists in, again, common law, suggesting that taxes are not only illegal under common law, but they're also optional. So uh, the viewpoint certainly challenges the traditional understanding of everything we know and all the legal practices and principles that underpin our society. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty shocking. I mean, I, I'd like to see this be applied into everyday life. If people can become more familiar with these laws, I, I really think things could change fast because we're all being subject. And with everything else going on, as far as, uh, you know, in the traditional banking system, it's taking us in a path where there is no way we can come back from that. And that's digital. So with everything going digital, it's just kind of locking us up in a prison in a way. I don't know about you. I, I'm in technology. I was an engineer for a bit. And I I can see more of the, the cons with technology than the pros. Mm -hmm. You know, don't get me wrong, technology, I'm all for it. But there's m many things that are putting us in a corner. And it's really damaging too. So if we're going digital too, and I've said this before, we need some sort of digital constitution of human rights but 
we need to apply this for sure. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how we're going to get there, but this is pretty amazing. Are you equipped to share what money actually is and how money differs from currency? Because that I think is helpful for people to understand and how we basically got into this mess with central banking in the first place. Well, yeah, that really started with the, the Federal Reserve. We were tied to a gold standard and that really kept our currency stable. And when Nixon in 1971 took off the gold standard, that's when he gave complete authority to central banks. But, you know, this was in 1913 is when the Federal Reserve was established, but that's really the crux of it. When they took the gold off the dollar, they were able to allow the central bank to print so much money. And what they did with that money is build the military industrial complex. And that's the same people that are reverse engineering all kinds of technologies. And they don't want to share it with the public. They don't want to help us. So what money really is, is, is it's just a medium of exchange. But what we've done here in this situation, that they've actually taken money and created a situation where we kind of screwed ourselves by going along with it. So our money is worthless now, but it's really just the banks. They printed so much money right now. And uh, you know the debt is exponential and it's out of control. So one of the things I wanted to add to that, a lot of us don't realize that constitutionally, we were supposed to only have gold and silver as legal tender. Mm -hmm. um, and when the government came and confiscated the gold, I think that was 1933, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it was 19. Uh, it was it was somewhere around that time frame for sure. I think Roosevelt was in office at the time. Yeah, it was Roosevelt. The country was, as I understand, was essentially bankrupt. And so they went to confiscate the gold. And at the time, his, in terms of history, what I had learned over you know my education was that if you had $1,000 worth of gold and the government confiscated it, they, they had to give something in like kind value, right? And so we were told, hey, if you had $1,000 worth of gold, they would give you $1,000 worth of basically fiat currency, right? As payment for it. But it all of a sudden occurred to me, and I think it was, I was actually, as I was reading the book that we're talking about today, or another one of the books in the series, it occurred to me that they didn't give us something in like kind. Because not only did they take $1,000 worth of gold and say, fine, maybe here's $1,000 worth of paperback, but they took away our ability to pay anything in the future. Does that make yes. sense? So, yeah. so in order to give like kind, this is where the whole fraud comes in. In order for them to give like kind, if they took away our ability to pay under common law, essentially gold and silver, and now we don't have the ability to pay for anything in the future, what was the remedy for that was essentially infinite credit. And that at that point in time, we basically became creditors. We became the backing for the government when the central bankers came in and said, well, how are you going to pay us back? And the government, the small handful of people basically said, well, we'll give you our people as collateral. And this is where the whole like ownership of people, I think, really was cemented. This is Yeah, this is when people became commodities in a sense and merchants. Because most, yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, exactly what you said. And, but this is why it's so important that we get back to a gold standard. And many people disagree with me on this, and that's fine. But I've heard Judy Shelton say this. I've heard many other individuals say this, experts, that we need to go back to a gold standard. And they're like, oh, well, it's never going to happen. Well, with blockchain, it can happen again. It really could. Yes. Many will disagree with me on that, and that's totally fine. But I really think that it's going to be backed by a basket of commodities. And now this new system that they're putting together, I don't really know if it's to free humanity or to enslave it, because I've been hearing things from both sides, and I'm sure yep. you have too. Yep. Uh, our sources are telling us that there are white hat military operations going on to overthrow this cabal and this banking system and put common law back into, into our hands again, the people. And if that's the case, and if that really is happening, then we do need some sort of gold standard or a digital gold standard. But the direction, the IMF, the BIS, and all these institutions are taking, and this is really what I cover, they are going back to some sort of digital gold standard in a way. Now, I don't know if they're setting this up for themselves again or to enslave us and keep us with central bank digital currencies while they keep their thing like that. Yeah. So 
interesting to see how it's going to unfold, but yeah, we'll I see. think one of the things that's important to recognize is why a gold standard is different. And in my mind, as I think about it, and part of the reason why I think the founding fathers of, of America said that constitutionally that the only legal tender was going to be gold and silver was because you have a finite commodity. The finite commodity creates accountability. If you're only able to spend what you have, it keeps a tap on corruption and criminality. The reason this is, and this is why a lot of people are saying, I, I read a quote one time, Abraham Lincoln during the highest tensions of the civil war was asked, what is the greatest evil? And he said, debt. And I remember reading that and I was like, how is, how would you say that when you're literally dealing with slavery and civil war and all the bloodshed? And when you think about it, you begin to understand when you realize that there is finance behind all of that. There's finance behind all of these conflicts. If you look at what's going on with Russia and Ukraine right now, and you look at the money, if you look at the corporate takeovers, all of this is being fueled by what we think of as finance, but not a gold back, not a finite backed commodity. It's an infinite, I can push a button and print trillions of dollars, what we call fiat currency. And that mm -hmm. to me is the big differentiator. And I do agree with you being in technology. I know you know this. Like technology is neutral. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. And I do think that we are at a pivot point and understanding these principles will allow us to move into blockchain. Blockchain doesn't necessarily change the fundamentals. It gives us more enhanceability and gives us more. I think that there's a way to create perfect money in blockchain, but it has to be essentially finite slash possibly gold backed. Yes. And that's the thing. See, a gold standard, what it does is it it offers so many other things that are so important that we need. But the gold standard really serves to constrain, like you said, on monetary policymakers. It prevents them from pursuing their own agendas. It prevents them from overly expansioning the currency supply and inflationary policies, too. And this is exactly what we're seeing today. In fact, I put a tweet out, so important, I'll read it to you real quick. Did you see also they changed the logo for Twitter? That was unusual. I, yeah, it's, it's now X, right? Today, this is one of the things that took place is the Federal Reserve FOMC meeting was in session today. And I, I was trying to make a joke, but Jerome Powell's logic is this. Basically, inflation is caused by higher interest rates. So he's saying we should combat inflation by raising interest rates even more. <laughs> so just by these policies here, middle class people are going to suffer even more. In the next few weeks, you'll see there's going to be higher gas prices, higher energy bills, again, expensive groceries. Things are just going to keep going up. And this is exactly why we had a gold standard. It was so that they couldn't screw things up in Washington for everybody else. And that's exactly what they're doing. Mm-hmm. We talked a little bit ago about the Federal Reserve, and I've mentioned this on previous podcasts, but explain to people who the Federal Reserve actually is, because a lot of people think it's the government, a division of the government. Uh, the Federal Reserve is really just a private entity. Many people don't know this, but the Federal Reserve is actually put together by the European bankers, Rothschilds, some of the other more prominent families. But th they are really the central bank of the United States. They claim to play a crucial role in the country's monetary policy, but it's really just their monetary policy, not ours, not under. <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're just playing their game and they were established in 1913. Uh, many people know this, many don't, that there were multiple bankers around the world at the time, prominent bankers with a good heart who saw what they were trying to do and accomplish and thought that we could vote against this. They were all invited onto one of the ships I think the Titanic people claim, and they sunk it and they killed all of them. And the next year they went and put in the Federal Reserve, exactly what those people wanted to protest. They put into action. Another thing people don't know is that John F. Kennedy was the last person to really challenge the cabal, the central bankers, essentially. What he did was try to put us back on a silver standard. He put an executive order in, and that's one of the things that got him killed as well. 
another thing is dismantling the CIA. But I mean, there's so many times that people have tried to get us to the right place and they end up dead. So, you know, this is something people should be concerned about because with the way things are going right now with our current monetary policy and our dollar, it's it's going to be very, very tough for so many people out there who don't have a clue what's going on. Millions, in my opinion, are going to die in the next few years as things continue to get worse because they're not going to get better unless we change something mm-hmm. and we have to put this new system in place and Hopefully it's going to be there to free us because it can, it can free us. If we take, there's enough resources on the planet to, to take care of everybody. There really are another rabbit hole. I want to briefly throw out there breadcrumbs is that there are more continents out there that nobody has ever seen. And no one's going to believe that that's totally fine, but it's out there. I promise. They could go do their research and due diligence. I promise in time, it's going to eventually come out as everything else is slowly coming out. Uh, But there's a lot of resources out there. And if we wanted to do this digital commodity-based system, and we've heard many of these central planners talk about this, it could really free humanity. And even XRP in its design initially was there to redefine the whole concept of money. By pegging all the commodities to this, this price would be so high of this asset where money wouldn't be on your mind ever again. In fact, we really could free the whole world. Really, we really could with the technology we have today, but we're not seeing that. They're just delaying it and they're dragging this shit show on and many people are getting hurt by it, including myself. We're feeling the pinch. My businesses are suffering. We're going to have to shut down one of our stores. So, you know it's not going to look pretty for many people moving forward. It's my assessment that we are going to be shifting from this old system to a newer blockchain based system. And that during that transfer, there's going to be a lot of people that are left behind or not knowing how to navigate it, or perhaps, you know, channeled into a CBDC that they then really don't have any value. It's not going to have any long standing value. Is that your assessment as well? How do you see this unfolding in the next five years or so? Sure. So, you know, people keep saying America is the greatest superpower in the world. Despite the U.S. being a superpower, the USA is actually grappling with more internal economic challenges and conflicts. The middle class is witnessing a sharp decline in the poverty. Credit card debt is soaring, which means people are having to borrow more money and pay higher interest rates for them. So as a response to these issues, this is exactly what they're doing to maintain some financial stability. The US, they've been exploring for a long time now and many other countries around the world about central bank digital currencies. They say, and this is how they're going to sell it, that can revolutionize the financial landscape, offer instant settlements, trust, reduce transaction costs. But you know, their real implementation behind this, it, it raises concerns about individual privacy and potential governmental controls over your transactions. So there's no doubt about it. We are on the cusp of a great wealth transfer with everything being rapidly digitized. But, you know, I I believe that, and that's why we invested in XRP and many of these technologies, because we believe here that if we invest in the pillars that are putting this new system together, maybe we can come out this okay. But we really don't know how it's going to unfold. But central bank digital currency, you do not want to be under a CBDC. It's totalitarian. It really is. So the way I see things, though, moving forward is, and I've said this before, they could continue to drag it on, keep raising interest rates, keep devaluing the currency, make people hurt so much. So they beg for this new system. And even the most overzealous people who don't want the CBDC will do anything for hunger. So if they're weaponizing the food industry, which they are, weaponizing the water, weaponizing medicine, they're weaponizing money. It doesn't look too pretty. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you really understand how they view the world and that we literally are their property, mm-hmm. you, you got to understand what we're dealing with here. Like this isn't just this organic thing that's kind of people trying to figuring out right now. This has been in the works for a long time. The very nature of a central bank means that you're in debt from day one. 
like I tried to explain this to my kids and this is how I shared it with them. I said, look, let us say you're starting a nation today and you have no money because this is what happened in, in America. And all of a sudden a group of people comes to you and says, hey, we'll lend you, you know, $10,000. You say, okay, cool. And you get that $10,000. They said, what? There's going to be interest. I'm like, well, you know, it's understandable. I'm borrowing it. So I'll pay you back with interest. Right. So you take that $10,000 and then you go to pay them back and you owe them $11,000. Well, where does that extra thousand dollars come from? And they go, oh, we have an idea. We'll blend it to you. And you go, okay, cool. Thanks. But there's going to be interest on that. And anyway, what you can see is by the very nature of the central banking itself being a debt-based system, you are consistently from day one going further and further and further into debt. And that doesn't even – we're not even talking about fractional reserve lending and some of these other principles that have compounded this problem. But that is why we're at where we're at. And what most people don't realize – and this is why JFK – I think it's one of the reasons why he was taken out. He – saw this problem. And there's no reason why the government itself, remember, we're not getting our money from the government, we're getting it from these central bankers and it's debt. There's no reason why the government itself couldn't issue the money. And if the government issued it and there was no interest on it, if there was a trillion dollars in the system, there would be no inflation. Remember, inflation is the expanding money supply. More and more and more and more and more. So if there was only a trillion dollars and that's all we had to trade around and it was backed by a finite commodity, now you have corruption and criminality held in check by the very nature of because you can't print more gold. You can't just create more gold. And if you have honest people that are running the government and they're not inflating the supply, then it keeps everything in check. That's why I think Lincoln said it was one of the greatest evils. I think it's also one of the reasons why he was taken out, because he wanted to create a greenback issued by the government, not from a central bank. I think that's why JFK might have been taken out. We need to understand this because as we move into this whole economic system, we want to be able to navigate it with prudence, with with intelligence, and hopefully with goodness at the end of the road. <laughs> yeah, freedom. everything you said is spot on. But again, gold is a key element here. You want trust, you need gold. That's how that's how it has to be. But the traditional banking system now is it's been the pillar for a very long time, almost 100 years, but the cracks are now showing. And you know, many people don't understand how insolvent the financial sector is. We keep printing, we're in this never-ending cycle of printing more money and borrowing and printing and borrowing. And it's gone, like you said in the beginning, it's gotten us deeper and deeper into debt. So the minute they produced one fiat currency dollar, it, it raised the purchasing power of the next one that was going to be created. For every dollar that you you create, you owe like two back for it, something yep. like that. So you're in debt the minute you started this. What's really interesting is like, why did they do this? Did they do this so they can just continue to grow the country the way they wanted to? Yes, and absolutely. Did they do it in the best interests of the people? No, they didn't. But the financial sector is completely insolvent. Many people don't know this. The banking crisis hasn't even really begun. I've been saying that the next one is Deutsche Bank, and it's because they are <laughs> they're giving out more loans than they have in reserves and assets inside. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really crazy. But this is exactly why central banks are also buying gold. You know, people forgot about that. Central banks are still buying gold in record amounts, right? Yes, yes. In record amounts. And it's not just the US central bank. It's other central banks around the world too. Well, if people keep saying, oh, like Mark Cuban said the stupidest thing ever. I can't believe it. Mark Cuban said, anyone that buys gold is an idiot. I mean, that is stupid. Coming from a bright mind like him, multi-billionaire, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard him say. That's when I knew he was full of shit. Excuse my language. All good. I, I, I actually was in a conversation with somebody on social media yesterday about this very issue. And their, their perspective was they're seeing all of these gold commercials, which we've seen now for the last probably 15, maybe 20 years on every conservative, you know, outlet, you'll, it's got to buy gold, got to buy gold. And from their perspective, I think what they're seeing is, you know, the minions running in fear to go buy gold. But when you back out and you understand the principles that you and I are talking about right now, then you understand why gold is a pillar for economic stability and anti-corruption, anti-criminality. 
because it cannot be manipulated. Well, it can be manipulated, but it's much more difficult to manipulate. Gold ETFs are a great way to manipulate gold, but that's more paper. Yeah. But the reason gold is able to be manipulated right now is because we can still print money. That's it. Mm -hmm. So they want to play with the markets that way. And that's exactly what they've been doing. Think about it. There's a finite supply. I think the derivatives market is the biggest, I was going to say the biggest bullshit out there. It really is. Some of these companies have trillions in derivatives in silver. There's not even that much silver on the, you know, in finite amount, physical silver. So, you know, these numbers are crazy. What I think is going to happen though, and this is probably why the Bank of International Settlements moved their asset class of precious metals from a tier three to a tier one, is because they're going to have to reset the price. It's very possible. One way people, you know, see this is if, if they reset the gold price to a lot higher, it could shrink the debt, maybe something like that. There are a few ways to look at this, but the only way we're going to see real stability is gold. And if we're going digital now, we have to have some sort of digital gold standard. And if there's going to be a digital gold standard, I tell you, man, the only one that can either meet that criteria is XRP or XLM. It's one or the other. So let me ask you about that, because I, I know you guys are not advocates of Bitcoin, but a lot of people say Bitcoin offers no utility. But I, at least from my perspective, the utility is that it offers no utility. The utility is that it is slow, that it is finite, that you can't expand it. Is it possible that you could have a Bitcoin backed currency that essentially is digital gold? I, I know I've said a lot of negative things about Bitcoin in the past, but you know, I, I, I've never said that, for instance, Bitcoin has no utility. Hmm. I, I think it has utility. People are using it as a medium of exchange. That's outside the central bank's purview. That's pretty cool. Uh, but the thing is, there's other technologies that can do it faster, cheaper, they're more scalable. And that's just the way I see it. You know, the way I see it is that if there are faster scalable currencies out there, why wouldn't they be used? If you want to do something, you know, like a gold backed currency, for instance, you could put it on the XRP ledger and it could be like a form of digital gold. David Schwartz actually said this once. That XRP is like digital gold. It can teleport anywhere around the world in three seconds. That's exactly what he said. I have it on Twitter if I was to share this screen with you. I, but hmm? I was going to say, I think that to me, the difference is the technology is one thing, but the core fundamental principle of a finite commodity and Bitcoin, as I understand it by its very nature is finite and that there cannot be any more Bitcoin minted. I mean, obviously, after we go through its its full minting. And, and so therefore, there's basically a accountability, whereas XRP, can't can XRP, they can burn and can you create more XRP or is there a finite supply of it? It's a finite. finite supply. So the way I would like to describe it this way, the way I see XRP's technology be utilized and the way I was taught it in the beginning, and I went to do my own due diligence and don't get me wrong, I've made mistakes before. I don't know it all. I'm, I'm still learning. All of us are. And that's the importance of the discussions we have. But XRP, it's got 100 billion. All right. People talk about the escrow. I could care less about the escrow and I'll explain why. If there's 100 billion XRP and it's the fastest, cheapest, most scalable digital asset out there, and many technologies can be built on it, upon it, right? Or around it, that's great. But at some point, when this is, and, and you see all the partnerships around the world, and you know we're not seeing any utility just yet. A partnership is one thing, that's great, but we're not seeing utility. So if they're going to be using this stuff and all this, these partnerships, I got document files so big, man, of every document, like partnerships. I'm old school, man. I, I put everything on paper here, you know, <laughs> all paper, man, ripple, say everything's on paper, you know, all this partnerships. And that's just one. I got files like this. So what I'm trying to say is that the minute these things go live, they're going to start being using the XRP ledger or XRP. And what that's going to do is it has a burn rate of 0, 0.0 something XRP per use case. So there's not enough, in my opinion, enough XRP to facilitate the global demand for what they need to do to move money around the world. 
So that's why I've said the price is going to be set very high. And I'm not the only person who has said this. If you go back 2016, 17, maybe earlier than that, you can find videos of David Schwartz saying this. You could find videos of, what was his name? Jed McCaleb talking about this before he left Ripple. So, you know, it, it, many people will say, no, that's not possible. David Schwartz never said that, but he did say that, you know, mm -hmm. it's just the way when you understand the technology, it makes more sense. But also if you look at the traditional banking system and what the problems are over there and kind of everything we just talked about, it makes even more sense to use a technology like this because you could do other things with it too. So, you know, there's a lot of information out there. A lot of people are giving different perspectives on this stuff, but the way I see it, and my brother and I, we've been through this in and out. I'm just so tired of like talking about it at this point. This is going to be utilized by the world governments and the world institutions. And if you think that you could fight the governments with money, their, their own system, I, I don't believe that is something that's really, it's not realistic to believe that you could compete with their currency. Another thing that I'd like to raise is SHA-256. It's really a cryptographic hash, that function that actually belongs to the SHA uh, family of hash functions. So there's a few of them. And they're, you know, they're used for um, data integrity, data signatures, and secure data transmission. But when you look at Bitcoin's technology, it's layered on that SHA-256. Now, who created CHA-256, this algorithm? You realize it came from the National Security Agency, the CIA, uh, Mossad, MI6. They had some involvement in all of this, the cryptographers. So it just raises questions behind the true motive of Bitcoin and who's really running it, who owns the most Satoshis, if you will, because they could dump this thing anytime if they really wanted to. Another thing is Tether. Tether is something you should keep a very close eye on. Tether has been, it's like a, the Federal Reserve's printing machine. And what they do with Tether is they print artificial numbers to inflate the price of Bitcoin and create the illusion of some sort of stability in there. The same way our banks prop up the markets to create the illusion of financial stability. They're doing the same thing with Bitcoin and Tether. So Tether, if Tether goes and Tether's broke the buck, how many times? Mm -hmm. Two or three times now they broke the dollar? Well, if it was a stable currency, it'd be stable. But what is, the, what is Tether backed by? It's backed by the United States dollar. But what is the dollar backed by? Nothing. So the whole thing's a joke. It's a Ponzi scheme. And I'm not saying Bitcoin's a Ponzi scheme, but I know Tether's involved in a lot of other weird and nefarious shit I don't want to get into trafficking and all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, some billionaires, crypto billionaires exposed them for being involved in trafficking with Tether through Puerto Rico and Costa Rica. And they got killed, you know, because they had influence. I don't have influence. I only have 30,000 subscribers. Don't worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, you know, it's just, it's crazy, man. There's so much information out there and I get lost in the rabbit hole sometimes of other topics and you can start to put pieces together without even having to see the full picture. And that's just, some people are born with that gift. It's intuition on another level. I do have that gift, but when I read these documents and I see what I'm talking about, and by the way, I've spoken to you on the phone a few times. When we get off our call today, I have a phone call with Linda P. Jones. I have a phone call with XRP Lion. I have a phone call with a few other friends and I'll be speaking to people at NASA tomorrow. I'll be talking to other dear friends of mine. So I, I have a lot of people, experts who I actually speak to and they leave breadcrumbs for me to go do more of my due diligence, but we kind of go back and forth. So not all of what I'm saying is coming out the top of me. These are things I've heard too. And I just trying to articulate it the right way, I guess. Yeah, I hear you. It's a real service. We appreciate that. I wanted to ask you before we wrap up here, are there any concerns that you have with XRP and some of the associations that it has? Because some of them seem to be tied into the central banking and some of the, the quote unquote, they that we've been talking about that we're wanting to avoid. So what's your thought on that? You know, it's a very good question. I've thought about this many times with my brother and we've had many discussions. Yes, we are concerned. We're very concerned, in fact. 
We're, we're very concerned because we don't know who's pulling the strings. We have an idea, but we really don't know what's going on. This is something else I'd like to talk about is that my brother and I, we're very, we're not religious people, but we, we strongly believe in God. We're very close to our faith. We're, we're Muslim, but we're very close to our faith as in, you know, deep spiritual connection. And that really guides us in a way too. And I'm not saying I hear voices in my head, <laughs> like some of the other people out there, you know, but I, I trust my, my gut because I follow my heart. And my heart will always tell me what's right and what's wrong. So the way I see it, I see everything wrong, but it seems like this is the direction it's going. And you, some things you can't control, you can't stop. The way I see it is maybe it's better to align in a certain way. I'm not saying go get a chip in your hand because I've said this before, if they actually, and, and this is interesting, Ripple was working with a company out of Denmark you could look this up where they're building a chip that goes into your hand. I'm not kidding about that. But if I had to put a chip into my hand to go down this path of riches and I'm not going to do it, I wouldn't sell out. I don't sell out like that. It would be wrong to put anything in my body. And I didn't even take the vaccine, by the way. I'd like to throw that out there. Yeah. You know, so yeah, there are problems, but the way I see it is just position yourself with some sort of exit strategy because that's the way it's going. You can't beat governments at their own game. So it's better to position yourself accordingly and kind of have a smooth exit strategy if you can. I, I've said this on my short too before. I don't know how it's going to play out, but we have an idea. So you know, this is why you have to have gold and silver too, physical assets, have some water, have some food. Got enough water and food for two years, man. I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to Costa Rica. I went and bought food and water. <laughs> <laughs> Please heed that advice. I think you're onto something with that, Prasan. Last question. What, what is your purpose with Black Swan Capitalists? What impact are you looking to create? Well, Black Swan Capitalists, Vendel and I, first of all, we, we, this is really a learning path for us too. We are here to learn as well. But what we've learned so far, it's it's tremendous. So what we really do here is we try to teach people how to strategically master the art of digital asset selection, how to shield their wealth. Uh, we also show people how to fully capitalize on you know blockchain revolution and just how to protect your hard-earned money from inflation and fortify your wealth. That's really what we do here. And um, I got to tell you, you know, I'm uh, being an engineer and a musician way before that. I started this in finance in 2018 and i've learned so much to where i can actually teach this with confidence and embrace it you know to other people there so that's really what we do and we're here to help mm. well your heart comes across both you and vendel your brother and with all the content that you create and we feel that and we appreciate that and i'm grateful that you're willing to share your mind with us and help us understand the puzzle that is very difficult to put together. So we thank you very much for that. For folks that are interested in following you guys, where is the best place for them to go? Uh, they can find us on YouTube, Black Swan Capitalist, or our website. If they're looking for a one-on-one -on -one coaching or session, they want to talk to us about anything. And that's blackswancapitalist.com, correct? Or is it uh, uh, so operable? Blackswancapitalist.io. Awesome. Versan, thank you so much for an incredible conversation. And we'll have to do it again sometime soon when we have <laughs> some more rabbit holes to go down, man. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day, man. Thanks again for the conversation. Me too. Thank you for listening to this episode of Wired for Impact. If you're interested in creating and expanding your impact, be sure to visit us online at impactnow.com.